everybody, welcome back to Post Call Gaming Grand Rounds. It's a special episode today. Usually whenever we do these episodes, we talk about the latest gaming industry news, uh, and each of the stream team members give a diagnosis for some of the games that they've been playing. But today, glorious today, we're going to be recording a special episode because guess what? It is almost time for Nintendo to release the next big Smash title for the Nintendo Switch, and I wouldn't have anybody else here with me uh, other than my great friend and co-host for tonight, PW. What's up, everybody? PW, this is the first time we've had you on a Grand Rounds. I know, it's exciting. <laughs> I, uh, I really appreciate the invitation to be on for the Smash Cast, especially uh, just given how long i played these games. And also, I mean, I'm not sure uh, uh, the amount of times we played on D. <laughs> yeah, so we're going to get into it. Today's podcast, we're going to structure it into two kind of halves. We're going to start off by talking a little bit about the history that PW and I have playing Smash, especially playing Smash together. And then we're going to dive into some discussion about Ultimate. And um, hopefully we're going to wrap up the podcast with a fun little podcast bonus <laughs> that we've talked about before we started recording that it hopefully will be fun for the listeners. Maybe not maybe not pleasant on your ears, but fun for you guys to listen to. Uh, <laughs> so why don't we start off? Uh, and we're also sorry, we're also going to do one more segment that we're going to start introducing on Grand Rounds, which I'm not going to spoil now, but I think would be really fun to have while PW is on the stream with us today. So PW, I'm going to start off with an easy one. Um, so... We're actually almost celebrating 20 years of Smash Brothers, which blows my mind. And I want to start off by asking, what is your history with this series? I started playing, um, like most people on the N64, but, um, oh man, just saying that it's almost 20 years makes me realize how old I am too. But 20 um, years? Yeah. Um, so I, I started playing on the N64 very casually with my brother and stuff. Um, and then, you know, ended up playing each subsequent release from there. Um, I did have, I also, I uh, one thing, I mean, I know it's not an official release, but I also had a chance to play like uh, quite a bit of Project M, which is a lot of fun. And uh, I think, yeah, it's just been, it's actually been really cool at the start of this series and then watching it evolve and grow and having played each one to some degree and it's on a kind of a you know more casual level but also on a competitive level it's been it's been an interesting thing to see especially with like you know more more tournaments more more uh kind of awareness of smash brothers as a viable game for you know i guess we're going to use that word esports but um uh, and, and i think it's really exciting what they're what they're going to do with the series moving forward i think it's only been getting traction with every new yeah i totally agree i think they been there's been a lot of momentum moving forward you know going from smash brothers 64 to melee to brawl to project m which was a fan initiative but then even to smash 4 that we're seeing sakurai starting to embrace more of the competitive aspects of this game and we're certainly going to dig into what ultimate kind of offers to the series from that competitive aspect but it's great to hear that you've started since the beginning because i think uh you know Aero and I joke about this all the time on stream, and I think PW and I are also able to joke on the stream that we're entering into that age bracket where we're older slash mature gamers. We're not obviously old enough to be able to say, like, back in my day, but um, it's it's really... I think it's going to be make this podcast really fun that we both have that history of starting way back on the 64. So to stoke the controversial fires, which one is your favorite? So um, that's a hard thing to... I, mean, I guess that's why I asked the question, right? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I have. I think I just have very fond memories of Melee for reasons that go also kind of beyond the game. Like I just kind of remember it being my first foray into meeting people at university, and then ended up playing it so much during that time. And and then also, you know, just when Melee came out, there was a sense of it just had so many new features. The graphics were amazing. Um, it just had so many new. I, I think it just kind of set the stage for how Smash Brothers was always going to continue to grow and to to try to one-up itself every single time like especially i i can't you know the the feeling that you get when you listen to the first menu theme of melee that kind of building of tension and excitement i think that is kind of what encapsulates it so much and also represents the series as a whole and i think like by just just because i think that was kind of also when you know i was in that stage of having enough time to practice and get really good but then also that being the more popular one that people played at the time i think melee if i had to pick one that's where i would go yeah, I was going to say actually exactly the same thing. Melee is also definitely my favorite Smash Brothers as well. So we're going to have to share a lot of similar opinions on this cast, I think. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I do want to throw a shout out to Smash 4, though. 
Um, although this is this is really funny because I feel like if anybody ever referred to Smash Brothers for Wii U as SSBU, they're gonna have a they're gonna confuse themselves uh, <laughs> with what's yep. coming down. Yeah. But uh, I I think I have to give a nod to Smash Four. I think because I think it was on the kind of on the cusp of just integrating a lot of elements of the previous um, entries into the series that made it this kind of overall like very accessible game, but still having enough depth, having a lot of new characters. You know, I I am I've always loved. The fact that they put in Shulk and, and I had a chance to play him in Smash 4 and I'm super excited that he's coming back to Ultimate. But um and I just think it, it opened up so much opportunity to kind of further refine this game and, and, and this concept that to be and I'm sure we'll touch on some of the new mechanic changes later. But you know, it, it's it's it, I think melee is just that right combination of nostalgia, the game being a technical, you know, marvel and stuff before. Um, but I, I do have to mention to Smash 4 for sure. Yeah, I think that's also a good kind of way to describe it. Is I think I, I think Smash Brawl Brawl was kind of this interesting dark period of time where I think a lot of people were starting to criticize Smash quite severely, and there was that period of time, especially with Project M, where I think the competitive side of Smash was being underserved, and so fans were really going out of their way to design content and modifications to try to get the game back, and Smash 4 kind of managed to blend the two. I think it was great to also see both games, both Melee and Smash 4, be represented at EVO. Um, So it's going to be super interesting to see how that landscape is going to change again once Ultimate gets released, because like PW was saying, we've we've got a whole list of changes here that we're going to go through from the Smash Wiki that describes a lot of the changes that Sakurai's already talked about on the directs which i think will be super interesting to see how much he's actually now feeding into the competitive side of smash which is super fun to see and just like what pw was saying i think melee was the one that really showed people that nintendo had the chops to make a fighting game that worked as a party game first and foremost that was really fun but also had enough technical stuff going underneath the hood that really drew people back in time and time again so, PW, now that we've established the fact that we're both Melee fans, you know, both clearly Final Destination, no items, what are some of your favorite moments playing this game that you can describe on stream? Um, so, favorite moments from Melee? Any any uh, stream, any, any title at all, any title within the series. Okay, okay, we might as well just go by one by one, because there's just so many. Um, any Super Smash Brothers game on Hyrule Castle and having someone get tornadoed uh, never gets old. Um, the uh, one other thing is playing on Pokemon Stadium and throwing people inside to the Pokemon, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, which was well, always a lot of fun. Um, well, I mean Saffron City, but yeah. And then uh, the other, I think the other fun parts uh, in Melee, I mean, oh, like just having those temple matches that never end. Like my brother and I, we used to do this. Well, I mean, we were good at this game. That you know, he would play Young Link, I would play Link. We didn't, and it took us just finally finished playing on temple because of well you know the the pit of uh, the pit of recovery and also just uh you know i guess a lot of link mains like to throw bombs and so that's a whole other game in itself right, um right all brawl had you know brawl had its subspace emissary from which i actually enjoyed like there's definitely a lot of um you know kinks i think they can work out you know which you could definitely talk about when we're you know talking about the new world of light but um but i i think it was just such a fun thing i think people are so excited for it because it just it's like bringing everyone together and you know everybody's you know, back the most- yeah, in, insert the most ambitious crossover event, and it's not the Avengers joke here, but I, I think that was one thing that, you know, people were so excited to see, because, you know, even if you play these games competitively, I think one of the reasons that you're drawn to these is because you like the characters, you know the characters, you've been a Nintendo fan, or at least, you know, you're a fan of, of, of what they've done, bringing all their mascots to this game. Um, and, Project and it's, M... It's totally like a fantasy setup too, right? Like, it's totally a... Um, yeah. It, it's like, who who would beat who in this Nintendo battle crossover? Yeah, uh, and uh, I think too. Like I, I think one of the things like it's always funny when you're trying to ask yourself like who would beat who, and you go from this place of thinking like okay, like maybe theoretically this is it, but then it's all based on frame data. At the end. Exactly. <laughs> um, Project M. I had such wonderful time realizing that my my character. Well, at least I played Zelda a lot in Melee because I got really tired of playing the top tiers. So I said, let's see how far I can go with Zelda, and. Um, <laughs> And, uh, yeah, and as surprisingly a decent amount um, until my opponents learned how to multi-shine, and then I was like, okay. Oh, but, uh, gravy train is but, over. Um, 
<laughs> yeah, but it was a lot of fun. I got a lot of grabs to lightning kicks and everything, which was very, very satisfying. Um, but in Project M, Zelda's like actually viable and has decent fireballs and is just a joy to play. So I remember the first time I played that, it was like taking the weights off my ankles and running. Um, Smash 4, I think... Smash 4 is one of those games where... You, you create all these moments through the matches that you have, and it's not even necessarily, like, the stages or anything, but I think it's the characters that make me, you know, remember all the stuff and playing online and, and having, a, like, a decent functioning online mode. Because I remember when I was playing Shulk and just trying to get better at Shulk, you know, trying to just learn all of these tricks with the Monado and, like, lag canceling and doing all this interesting stuff. And I think the fact that there was just... Smash 4 was, like, with that first game where there was just so many characters that it, it really creates this grand feeling of, like... Like, you're going to pick someone, you're going to master them, you're going to try and learn the game, learn the characters, and really bring it to other stuff. Because, mm. you know, the competitive scene in Brawl was very limited, given that there was a very distinct top-tier character um, among maybe three. And then, you know, Melee itself only has really about six to seven viable characters yeah. that probably deliver results so smash 4 i mean you know eventually there was the whole bayonetta days and everything else but i have to say that in the beginning it just really just felt like this real opportunity to experiment with so many different characters and that was a lot of fun Mm -hmm. all right that's actually a perfect segue into the next question that i was going to ask you which is over time so again i i really love how you have such a history with this series because it, it gives me a chance to ask you now that we've seen the core eight now expand to a roster of over 70 characters who has who have been your mains across the series like and it doesn't have to be just one but who would you say you have kind of played consistently or or remains in your mind as being a favorite to use so link is hands down the first person i ever played um because of my love of legend of zelda but also just it was just fun to use the bombs and the boomerangs and try to boomerang into an app smash and do just a, a bunch of different things that you feel like you set up and you feel clever doing it because it took some planning. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, so I, I've always played Link in whatever game it's been because I always just really enjoy it. Um, Mario got more interesting over the years, <laughs> um, especially in 4. I just think his whole toolkit is really interesting. He's, he has really good aerial movement and everything else. So I've never gotten bored of playing Mario. Um, any, like most of the Fire Emblem characters, so Marth, Ike, or Roy, I usually end up playing one of them because it's just super fun. And I do really like the characters a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, the uh, Shulk, as I was mentioning in Smash Brothers 4, uh, I picked up and I just had a blast playing him. And um, I've been a victim after- of this Shulk many, many times over the last little while that we've been playing Smash 4 together. Yeah, it's just it's it's so much fun using the Monado, and especially after you play the game, it, you get this kind of extra feeling of just like a lot of it's just really satisfying to to play that character once they're in there. Um, and uh, I think you know in Brawl, I definitely like playing Lucario a lot. Like he just seemed like a really cool character, and the whole idea of like getting better with damage as being kind of part of his innate abilities was mm-hmm. a really interesting thing you could work with. I mean, they eventually generalized it in four, where mm-hmm. the rage mechanic thing, mm-hmm. but. Uh, but I, I just thought, in, especially in Brawl, it was so interesting that, that you could have this character um, that had also these disjointed hitboxes, the more damage took. So, uh, yeah, I would, I would have to say that those are probably my mains, you know, like Swordsman, the classic characters, you know, throw Lucario here and there. Um, and then, oh, shout outs to Little Mac. Um, as, as a character that most people think sucks uh, a lot, um, I had a lot of fun just playing Little Mac and learning how to play Little Mac, especially with his kind of unique super armor properties and really being able to control the ground game. Uh, I, I think that was another character that I picked up in 4 and just thought it was like such a fresh way to play the game. So um, I would also, also have to add Little Mac to that list. It's a pretty pretty eclectic mix. I mean, most of them are, are short, short range, with the exception of Link, who's got a little bit of more of a ranged arsenal but you you do tend to kind of stick closer to the melee range kind of characters i've found over over the years that we've played together yeah you know that's true uh, kind of just like that kind of, that, that balanced kind of you know whether it's zoning or rush down but kind of just yeah trying to keep within that one person to two care uh one two person space just to get in there and and try to try to control the flow of the match that way it's true so that that goes i think perfectly again into the next question which is uh over time what are your favorite ways to play smash i, I know we we started with the joke no items, final destination. But given the fact that you do love to play these pretty intense characters that do involve, you know, up close combat, is that your favorite rule set? What are the ways you like to play Smash at this point? Now, especially now that we've got custom rules, how do you foresee yourself kind of configuring a particular way to play Smash with Ultimate that would 
either increase the level of fun that you have or give you a strategic advantage with the types of characters that you like to play. I mean, I think ultimately I'm going to go with probably whatever the competitive scene is doing just to keep it <laughs> pseudo competitive or at least, you know, something that's agreed on. So like five stock, player. best of three, final destination slash battleground. <laughs> Yeah, or I mean, at least hopefully, like the neat the neat thing with the stages is now that they're going to be re- having a hazards remove option, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that'll probably open up the stage selection a lot more, um, which is also something I think is really exciting with Ultimate that I think could really increase the kind of variety that we see in the competitive scene. But I, th- that aside, I, I think just kind of whatever ends up being standard, like you know, in Smash with the two stocks, or you know, with melee, um, uh, I think. I'm usually happy with that because then at least it kind of, as long as something is set, it gives me a place where I can work from and try to think about where I can do it. Mm-hmm. My my least favorite has to be timed. I don't know why it's always the thing that Nintendo advertises or puts as the main uh, thing because almost no one who I know likes timed on a regular basis. Which is funny because, uh, I mean, that timed also is my least favorite mode to play as well. And I think a lot of it, and it's really interesting that you bring up that Nintendo loves to advertise timed mode. And I've always personally believed it's because for them, timed mode goes back to that level of Smash was originally intended to be a party game. It was originally intended for a younger audience and timed mode is very forgiving. So even though there are still very clearly winners and losers in timed mode, it is very much like it doesn't matter if you get killed, you'll just keep coming back and, and the objective is to do the best you can. It's a very family friendly Nintendo like message like you know as long as you're doing something as long as you're taking that other guy out you're contributing to score and you might not win but that doesn't mean if you lose you stop playing (laughs) yeah so kind of hopping back a bit and and then kind of talking a little bit about we've already sprinkled a little bit about the esports I, I do want to talk a little bit about the fact that Smash you know, we here at Post Call Gaming as the Stream Clinic team, we're obviously very excited about it. This is a game that has millions and millions of fans. You know, it's hotly anticipated. It's definitely going to be a bestseller this year. And I think part of that is because Nintendo, starting with Melee, has done a fantastic job marketing this game. They are very aware of what they have. They are very conscientious of the fact that this is a hotly anticipated title. And starting with, uh, not as much with Brawl, but I think definitely with... Um, Smash Brothers for 3DS and Smash Brothers for Wii U, we've started seeing them really taking these character reveals um, whenever they're introducing new characters into their roster and just blowing them up with these ridiculously gorgeous CG cutscenes with fantastic music. Um, and I just wanted to throw the question to you in your mind. Uh, and if you want to just, if you need any reference, it's in, it's in our little uh, shared podcast document down below. PW, who sticks out to you in terms of the most impressive or fantastic reveal in the history of this this twenty year old series, or at least in your opinion, which was the most kind of character that you saw that you're like, yes, this this is what I love to see. This is who I wanted in the game. Um, okay, so that's it's a layered question because because as much as like I love certain characters, I also know that some of the reveals are probably more impressive than us. you know. So for example, I mean, uh, in terms of how well it was done, I have to say Cloud is probably one of the best ones that have been done, mm. or, or Ryu, um, just because of how thematic the crossover was and how how almost seamless, like it was still able to maintain some sense of mystery Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh, until the reveal was done. And then the best part about it is that when you show the gameplay, it's so, it's so iconic to the characters that you, it really just feels like such a complete reveal. Like it's, it's the bridging of two series. And then you really just show how people from either series can feel home with with each other based on just how the character operates. Yeah, that's very true. So I I think I have to say, I think you and Cloud are probably some of the best well done um, that I've seen so far even little mac i mean taking taking his art style and translating it to you know his reveal was really interesting um pit and palutena definitely had the had the or at least Pal- palutena sorry had the you know the anime cutscenes, uh which yeah, is also neat the you know, everything's chats. really basic for their own games i but i do have to say like you know for most unique most well done i would have to say where you're a cloud my favorite character to get revealed no surprise is shulk um I mean, not that, not necessarily that wasn't badly done either. I think it just depends on who you really like in the game. Like when Shulk has his vision and then he dodges Marth and Link, who are both characters I already love. It's just really cool. <laughs> it's really <laughs> like, interesting. It's- Cause it's just one of those, it's just one of those fan moments where you're like, oh, that's so that's awesome. So when PW finally plays Xenoblade Chronicles two, whenever that is, we're definitely going to record a podcast because 
we were both people that loved the original game. He loved it. He loved Shulk. Let's put it that way. I think we both loved the first game a lot. He loved Shulk and the memes and some of the content around the game a lot more than I did. But we both genuinely loved this game. And I would love to sit down after you've played the second one and talk about what you felt. Because as we've joked about on stream before, especially when it's th- me, you, and uh, Aero on stream, you know very well I hated the second one. So I would love to have a chat. I think for me... Nothing has ever topped the reveal of Mega Man in this series. I think it's interesting because it's exactly the same stuff that you said about um, Cloud and Ryu, where his gameplay, uh, you know, the way he handles the the thing. But I, I just distinctly remember that direct, where the cu- I can even exactly per- perfectly recreate the cutscene in my head. You see this boy standing on the top of a cliff. There's a moon out. You can't make out his face. There's wind blowing through his hair. Then the helmet comes. You hear that distinctive blub, 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 blub sound. And you, I was freaking out. <laughs> I was genuinely freaking out. I was just like, this This is the video game character I've loved for all time. And he's finally in Smash. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I think the other character, if we're, if we're using that example of the cutscenes between Pit and Palatina, I think nothing has also topped um, David Hayter playing Snake and having Snake talk oh, to... Yeah to uh to um Otacon in brawl and just commenting on every character i think that was such a lovely touch and i'm really hoping that those yeah. return for ultimate for sure yeah all right before we wrap up this first segment where we talk about our history with smash i think we already talked about um we were going to discuss two things one was kind of the way nintendo has really grown this franchise to the to the masses that it's now appealed to i think the other important thing is um, Smash obviously has a very big reputation for just how dedicated the Melee fan base is to still playing Melee. People are still buying CRT televisions. People are still carrying GameCubes around. The fact that we're still buying the GameCube controller peripheral across three console generations now is hilarious because of how dedicated people are to that controller for this game. PW, in terms of your experience, um, what has been your level of exposure to the pro scene? What's your knowledge about the Big Five as they're as they're colloquially known, and how do you feel about the competitive scene overall? Because it's quite a controversial pro scene for a fighting game, specific, specifically for one that is exclusive to Nintendo platforms. So, um, I mean, so I, I'm not I'm not like a major competitor in the scene, but I definitely do follow it and watch like a lot of the streams and. And most of the big tournaments, you know, the knowledge of the big five, at least if we're talking about Melee, you know, you're talking about people like, you know, Hungry Box or Mewtwo King or, you know, the, I think sometimes referred to as the quote unquote five gods. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, interesting now it might be the big four, given that Armada, you know, uh, announced that he retired. But I think, you know, I think when people talk about the Melee competitive scene, I just feel as though it, it's really just, it, it just depends on how you look at it from the point of view of, um, um, because from the perspective of either the players or the spectators, and and the thing is, you know, I think to some people listening to the podcast, they may not, you know, know that one of the big resurgence of Melee, um, what's responsible for it is definitely a documentary that was made highlighting just how valuable playing that game was to both the players and the spectators who watch. And I think that was the other thing that kind of reignited a new wave of playing Melee and getting people involved. And it, I think there's a number of perspectives you need to look at from the competitive scene. Like some people have this attitude of maybe, well, it's an old game. Why are people still playing it? You know, why would you, you know, especially for companies that have no interest in, you know, selling old products anymore, like Nintendo, you know, why, why would that be you know, a priority for anybody? But at the same time, if you have this entire community that says that they love this game, they love playing it, they enjoy it, and it's you know, their hobbies and what, what, you know, brings them meaning in terms of playing a fighting game and not the one that they choose, then, you know, there's no real problem. Um, and I think from an external view, when people look at the Melee competitive scene, I agree that, like, perhaps sometimes, you know, depending on who you talk to, it might seem like it's a little insular or, you know, maybe you meet all kinds of people within communities, right? Like, I've met some Melee players who play Smash 4 and are excited for Ultimate or, you know, or also play other fighting games. I've met some Melee players who... You know, think their game is the only game in the world and that's it. But I don't think that's representative of everybody. Um, and I think so that's why I think when you when you have any sort of discourse about melee and its competitive scene, I think one of those two points tend to get brought up that you have people who cross play that you have people who, you know, are very staunch to this game, but it almost feels like any other community. Like, you know, when you think about um, when you think about fighting games in terms of past titles like Street Fighter 3, Third Strike, Street Fighter 4, 
and then now right now the one in the main line like Street Fighter Five. You're going to have some people who played those previous games, grew up with them, learned all of the intricacies to them, and want to stay with that because that's their comfort zone, you know. Um, and especially if the new games are radically different compared to the old ones in terms of mechanics, you may not get back a lot of those same people that you wanted uh, that that were or that originally played that that original game to bring them back to something that has that's new and that will make more money and that has new market share, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I, I think I think it's it's really impressive actually that Melee has managed to sustain this competitive scene for so long because it's a very old game. <laughs> I agree. Um, still showing up in tournaments and people are still supporting this. If you think about it, you know, nobody's playing Capcom versus SNK2 as a major title, as a main top seven Evo type um, to this day, even though it was an excellent game back in its day and you had lots of people playing it. So I think that says a lot about the community in terms of their dedication of wanting to play the game. The issue that I have or the thing that I wonder about is just that, you know, like with anybody who's grown up with the game since the beginning, jumping into the meta of something, even though, you know, in the original stages, people were still trying to figure out a lot of what's optimal in Melee. Now there's probably, you know, at least five Marth tutorial videos that you can watch to understand how to play the game. I think it's just some kind of like kinesthetic experience that's still valued from being one of the originals. And I think that's what we see in the big five that, you know, you can expect these people to regularly be in the top five if not win the tournament and in fact having someone who is newer to the game or someone who you know has not been had the same win record as them before if they somehow manage to break it you know into the into the top five or break a tournament that's really big news and i think depending on again who you talk to that's either really interesting or really boring because there are some people who are going to say that you know the meta is figured out we already know who's going to win what's the point of watching but then you have some people say well i dare you to go and watch you know you know um uh uh, it like the uh, hungry boxes, you know, come back from losers finals and eventually took the tournament. Um, to you know, so it, it, I think it depends on how p- how much people are in- invested in the players, like their personalities and and who they are, how much they're invested in the game, and how much they you know really just prefer sticking to what they're familiar with or have been introduced to by someone else versus saying you know you know here's the new stuff we should always stick with the new stuff. I don't think there's a right answer. I People are just always going to go with what appeals to them and what feels comfortable for them. And and like I said before, I have to give a lot of respect to the Melee community for keeping a game that is so old, you know, still as as vibrant as it is today. Because there's definitely a lot of fighting games that, you know, they have their niche communities that get nowhere to the level that Melee does. I. I think you make a really strong point here because like the only other fighting game I can think of that the fighting game community still embraces to this level of persistence probably would be Street Fighter 2. And I can't really name many other Street Fighter games that still continue to have a very vibrant community and competitive scene that is as visible or as loud as the melee crowd is, which really is something I think that they have that makes them particularly unique. Mm-hmm. So that's going to wrap up the Smash history. I think it's time now we get to look forward to the future, look forward to this wonderful new game that is coming out in December. Um, and we're going to spend a, a most the rest of this podcast with a little bit of the ending for something fun, but to talk about just how excited we are about Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. But I wanted to start off by asking, PW, are you aware of the Grinch leak? Do you know what the Grinch leak is? Hashtag team real, hashtag team, team fake. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. So, so, so the, I mean, I, what, what, what interesting marketing for the Grinch movie, by the way. <laughs> but, um, I, I, it's almost uncanny. I just, I, I, I almost wonder, like, did they plan that? I mean, did, did they just hand the Grinch, you know, material to some, to some leaker or, or renowned person who? You know, usually leak stuff for Smash games and just say, here, mark it for us. I, I, who knows? It's just insane <laughs> to me because, I mean, we live in an era where obviously people's ability to create more and more sophisticated leaks is becoming much more, you know, at a professional level. I'm thinking back to before when the Switch was revealed, there was this leak about the fact that the Switch was going to be this kind of super ugly Ellipse, ellipsical shaped you know controller that the entire thing was also a screen and your buttons weren't physical and there was this reflection of a tree and i remember the whole internet basically saying this tree is the tree that's outside gorilla games's office and people are saying this must be real and kimishima is going to send the ninjas to destroy whoever leaked this control and it turned out to be an elaborate 3d printed fake so now that we live in a post-direct world i think 
I'm gonna start off by asking PW, were you were you hashtag team real or were you hashtag team fake? So, um, I mean, I, I, I was I was very much looking forward to some of the characters on the fake reveal. Um, you know, Gino that would have been amazing. Banjo Kazooie, of course. Um, I know a lot of people that would have been sh- been happy by Shadow the Hedgehog. The the, uh, <laughs> the Ken I, Masters. I think, I, think, <laughs> I, think, I think ten year old me probably would have been very happy with Shadow the Hedgehog. Uh, I would mean, be nothing against like Sonic fans. I just I, it wasn't personally one at this venture that I, I felt like was a hundred percent you know needed in terms of, of value added. But I could definitely see the appeal. I know he's a popular character. Um, but uh, you know. I, and like, just I know people like so many people. I haven't even played Golden Sun, but like um, Isaac, I know has been so, is so anticipated. So I feel like part of me is laughing at this because I feel like Sakurai basically has his DLC pass list, um, which has already been decided. Of- by the way, it's been revealed that Nintendo has directly commanded Sakurai who these five characters are going to be. Well then. So, you know, I think I think we have a uh, I don't know, I guess maybe hopefully pe- more people will be, you know, will get the people that they wanted. I am not sure. I, I mean, again, I'm a Street Fighter fan. I am really happy to see Ken. A lot of people who are I mean, hey, some of the people who wanted Shadow the Hedgehog are probably rolling their eyes at me like, why do we need Ken? So, it's um, really interesting to me because I think when you watch that direct, there is some footage that is very it's almost as if it was specifically curated to make to address these leaks because we saw Isaac as an assist trophy. He's been an assist trophy before. We saw Shadow the Hedgehog as an assist trophy. I think that's the first time he's been an assist trophy. So I completely agree. There are tons of characters on this list that I was looking forward to. I was very much hashtag team real because if you go into reset era and you read people's analyses of these images, the amount of explanations people have come up with about how this could not have been fake is just insane people were doing crazy like spectrographic analyses of the light bouncing off people's bodies it was just it's just like a weird you know kojima level of metal gear conspiracy theory uh and it was just insane and and just like you i think it's interesting because um sakurai has revealed that nintendo has pretty much given him a direct executive order in terms of who these five DLC characters are. I do think it's it's challenging because with Gino, we know that the me gunner has an outfit that makes you look like Gino. Isaac's already an assist trophy. Shadow the Hedgehog's already an assist trophy. We've never been in this precedent. I don't think throughout history we have seen in the Smash series an assist trophy actually become a full member of the roster. So there's no precedent. So yeah, there's no precedent for it. And I think the other challenge is it's going to be hard to have a character entering into the roster that is simultaneously an assist trophy unless they figure either they take him out, like for example with Isaac, either they take him out as an assist trophy and make him a full membered cast. It's or, just or, funny or, because I feel like assist assist trophies were things that, you know, they wanted people to be excited for and now it's just become a source of disappointment. Exactly. Because I think the other thing that comes to light is the assist trophies sometimes feel like characters they created models for to try as full-time ads, and then they fail, and then they're like, well, we have this model anyway. <laughs> so they do yeah, a little animation, you know, a little an attack. But uh, I think, personally, I-, I do know that this leak harmed my personal takeaways from that direct, but I, I thought it would be fun to at least address... This because I do think in terms of I mean, the grand... The biggest thing that ticked me off that it was probably fake, to be honest, was the chorus kids. Like, I know we've had some quote-unquote, like, unexpected characters in Smash, like, you know, Duck Hunt, Game & Watch. Mm-hmm. Um, but for the life of me, I was just thinking to myself, how did it work? Like, you know, I'm sure there's some sort of moveset that somebody's already theorycrafted. I just, I felt more suspect reading that. Apparently they were the cut of, out of... The, um... rest of them, the rest of them, I was like, yeah, of course. Like, but that would be an excellent... But I think it's important to point out that apparently the Chorus Kids were planned. I can't remember if it was for Brawl or if it was for Smash 4, but apparently the Chorus Kids were originally planned for a Smash title at some point. Like, officially, not, like, rumor-wise. Like, it's been found in interviews that they may have actually been cut out. So, there was some precedent there. Interesting. But yeah, it's. It, I think it's... I think in the grand scheme of things, when people discuss the release context around smash ultimate i think we will always see people talk about this grinchly because i certainly think it played a huge part into kind of the hype that really has been building for this game so segueing off of that 
Uh, Pete, I'm going to ask you, first off, in terms of the newcomers, and again, on on our little podcast cheat sheet, we've got the whole list of all the characters um, that are going to be coming with Smash Ultimate, and as was dramatically announced at the Direct, everyone is back, plus some extras. I'm going to ask you first, in terms of the newcomers, who are you either happy to see, particularly excited about? I'm going to go ahead and read them off just for our listeners, for those of you who don't know. Um, spoiler warning to anybody who wants to go into Smash Ultimate completely spoiler-free, but I am going to reveal the new characters that have been revealed, and these are Daisy, who's an Echo Fighter, Piranha Plant, Piranha Plant who's been um, revealed as a basically like a pre-purchase gift, King K. Rool from Donkey Kong, Ridley from Samus, who's been a really high-demanded character for a long time, Dark Samus as an Echo Fighter, Incineroar, who's one of the uh, main three Pokemon that you get in Pokemon Sun and Moon, and is the final evolution, Chrom, who's an Echo Fighter, Isabelle, Inkling from the Splatoon series, Ken, who's an Epsilon Fighter for, for an Echo Fighter for, I'm reading the symbols off, Epsilon Fighter, <laughs> Echo Fighter for Ryu, Simon from Castlevania, and his Echo Fighter, Richter, and for those who haven't been keeping up at all with Smash, Echo Fighters are basically uh, model swaps, you can kind of think of them as like alternative skins, um, they do tend to have slightly different animations, but effectively they use a different character's moveset, and there isn't dramatically like a huge difference in their playstyle. So obviously, for example, Dark Samus is the Echo Fighter for Samus. So having said all of that, PW, who? Let's start it with the positives. Who are you excited to see among this list of newcomers, including the Echo Fighters? King K. Really, King K. Rool. Yes. I played so much of the Donkey Kong Country series, you would not believe, um, on the Super Nintendo. And then also DK64, he was there too. Um, and I, I mean, one, I think it's hilarious uh, that he's in because he's naturally a, just a very comedic character. Mm-hmm. But then funnily enough, he's also very threatening in the games. And I feel like when I watched this trailer, I just, they just, they fully captured that. Um, also, the DDD troll was pretty fun. He's but, very much but the, a Wario kind of clown-esque but a little jokerish like a little threatening kind of meld of character yeah like like he you know like he's he's funny because he he is he is funny but then you also know he has like a little bit of menace and that's what's the you know the thing that's made him into like such a like great donkey kong villain Mm -hmm. and i I felt like we didn't really have good representation and i'm so happy that it's not the tiki's um because you know if they're going to do a donkey kong villain like i've never personally been like really like, I, I love Donkey Kong Country Returns. It's amazing. Like, you know, it's such a great game. Same with Tropical Freeze. But I've never been so attached necessarily to, like, the villains that they've had because I feel like nothing has been as classic as King K. Rule. So having King K. Rule in the game was actually really, really fun. Um, the other, I mean, you know, if we're going to do the highlights here, because definitely, like, you know, I'm excited about Krom. Like, I, I like playing Roy. I like playing Ike. So why not both? Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> or Ken, I mean, you know... Street Fighter fan. I love Ken. I play Ken and Dirt Strike. You know, so uh, Simon, I played Super Castlevania 4, so just really excited to see. But the other one, which I feel like some people may not agree with me on this, Piranha Plant. <laughs> Piranha Plant is, is one of the funniest, most... And it's so funny because it's just, one, it's not something you'd expect, and two, the character actually looks good. I... I almost can't believe it. Like I was looking at some of the moves and I was like, "Oh, that that's actually pretty looks pretty good." But also on some level, it's just really funny. Like I, I don't know how to explain it. it. It's like it's like when people used to think, I guess, like Game and Watch was funny, even though like Game and Watch is really cool. But but I think Parada Plant is just such a like I think in some ways you could look at it as such a cop out of a character, but at the some at the same time, it it also just seems brilliant. Like I don't know how to put it. That's what I was gonna say. Like I think. I, I, I'm going to let's jump to the next part of this question, which is going to be like, are, is there anyone on this list that you're particularly disappointed by? Um, you know, like, OK, I, I mean, I think this all comes down to personal preference because I know there's definitely fans, um, you know, of different things. And, and so, like, I never played Animal Crossing, but I heard Isabelle's a great character um, Incineroar. I, I, I really don't know a lot of the new Pokemon gens. So I just kind of saw the trailer for Ken and then I saw Incineroar. I was like, cool, looks fun. Um, Daisy, I know, like, depending on who you talk to, like, they're, they're fans, so, and I think that's kind of a natural extension of an Echo Fighter, so I actually think that's a good idea. Um, are we talking about, are we also talking about people that were sad that didn't make it? No, just primarily with this Prime cast, because I think, I think, um, there's a lot of characters, I think, that everyone obviously wants to see in Smash, like, come on, where's Goku? But, I think, yeah, I think or to... like, well, I mean, I was just gonna say Waluigi. Waluigi? Oh... Uh... <laughs> 
<laughs> that's another that's another really popular um internet that's another, one. that's another podcast on its own i think yeah um, i think i think but, i share the same yeah, so like, disappointing characters i mean I, I i no i think this is a is actually a solid roster and what they chose to do with the echoes i think makes good sense um ridley i was never i like he was a boss in subspace emissary i thought that was cool but I never really said, well, yeah, no, I got to play him as a character. But I know it's something that a lot of people wanted. So, you know, I, I don't think any of it's really a bad move. Mm-hmm. Again, I just have the least connection to Incineroar. So I, you know, or the Inklings, I didn't play a lot of Splatoon. I'm going to say for sure Incineroar is my disappointment of 2018. That we did not need another Pokemon in this series. <laughs> and he's such a boring character. Maybe that's just me. But uh, I agree that Incineroar did not particularly excite me when I saw him on the direct. Um, so and, we're... And I think- yeah, Anything go ahead. that I thought like Incineroar, and again, like I don't know his full move set, I don't know everything about the character, but part of me, I guess, being a Street Fighter guy, was like, hey, they could have put in Sankey. <laughs> yeah, like I just, I just feel like he's taking, and it, I know everyone always gets really antsy when people say this, but I really do feel like he's one of those people that I would say he's taking a slot. Like this is a character I don't particularly feel like earned his way here, and I, and I, I do have this question or wonder of whether it was a slightly political move that they had to put a Pokemon from the latest generation in the game. Um, but unlike I mean, Green I mean, Ninja... I, I, would, I, would also, I would pretty much assume that that was the case, right? Like, you know, Lucario, I think at, there's one point where people who weren't following the um, necessarily the games or the movies were like, well, who's this guy, right? Um, but it's interesting but now... just because in contrast to Greninja, who I feel like the audience was very receptive to, from what I have seen of the overall internet response to Incineroar, it has been much more tepid in comparison. Yeah, that's fair. All right, so we're going to... I think it's fun to play the next little segment, which is going to be... We know that there are five characters coming out in DLC for this Smash game. Piranha doesn't count as one of them. Who are these five characters going to be? PW, give me your guess. Oh, man. Okay, so... I mean, you know, it depends on if we're looking into Echo Fighters or not, but, like, given the success of Xenoblade 2, I wouldn't be surprised if Rex and or... Um, Rex is a uh, me costume. Let's not forget. <laughs> oh, fair enough. So maybe maybe that's a deconfirm in itself. Rex was is a um, me costume, and Sakurai in the direct said, didn't make the roster so close, but not this time. <laughs> okay. Well, I stand corrected. Never mind. <laughs> um, so, uh, okay. Well... Okay, that aside, I mean, I think the smartest thing to do is, like, look at what other properties Nintendo has and also just see, like, who's popular, right? I mean, like, you know, Bayonetta is in the game and Cloud is in the game. I think many things are possible. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, you know, to some degree, I'm also, like, I know it's kind of probably been a running joke throughout the years, who in the game? And I feel like we can get, if we can get Bayonetta, cloud and you know we we um and we you know we have all these these really popular third party characters i feel like that would actually be a pretty smart move for nintendo just trying to bring in you know people who they know will definitely sell more people to the game and also um be like fan favorites so what uh, i'm hearing more- is goku luffy the dude from black clover Deku from My Hero Academia See, so and Naruto. You can't make it entirely anime. That's the, that's the thing. <laughs> it, it, and it needs to have it needs to have like you know a Dragon Ball. There's like Dragon Ball. There's Dragon Ball Fighters Fighter Z on the Switch. There's also Dragon Ball Xenoverse on the Switch. You know, so I think it needs to have like some connection. So Goku, but, um, Super Saiyan Goku, Vegeta, Super Saiyan Vegeta. I mean, now you're now you're just going into Fighter Z memes, but yeah. <laughs> um, the uh, the other thing. I think would be interesting was like, you know, from, from that team fake reveal. I mean, um, I don't know, like what, what's likely I have to think like, you know, Nintendo is a business, but when I think of like, what would be a great idea, um, you know, delivering on some of the stuff in that be really interesting. And the other thing that I would say is that, you know, this is a really good opportunity for Nintendo to put, if they're doing any revivals or any of their like new products or refreshing their old IP is like, if, if the sequel to Super came out at the same time Gino was revealed, 
uh, that would be an interesting business. Like, I think I would be excited. I, I played so much out of Super Mario RPG. So, you know, like, I, I think it just also just really depends on what Nintendo's planning to do with their IPs and, like, what they're planning to release in the future. Um, and I, I, you know, again, is, is are they going to kind of cater to the fans or are they going to cater to what they're releasing? I think that's going to be the big philosophy there. So I guess the interesting thing is, I, I think it's important to point out that Super Mario RPG, or the one that the fans are really clamoring for in terms of guest appearances, is the one Mario RPG that wasn't actually developed by Nintendo or by a Nintendo subsidiary. It's the only one that was developed by Squaresoft, now Square Enix. All the rest of the Paper Mario RPGs and all the rest of the Super Mario RPGs um, were contracted out to companies, either second party um, or have particularly close relationships with Nintendo. I'm thinking about Intelligence Systems, who does the Fire Emblem games, and I'm thinking about Alpha Dream, who did a lot of the DS and GBA Super Mario RPG kind of games, like um, the Mario and Luigi Superstar Saga is one that comes to mind. So mm-hmm. I think it's interesting to think about how Gino probably is a bit of a copyright nightmare, because I don't think... I've never actually come across anyone who's able to describe to me who actually owns Gino. I can't recall if he actually belongs to Squaresoft or not but as you pointed out you know cloud is in the game so maybe that's less yeah i just i just feel like once cloud got in the game that everyone was like okay the doors are open anyone can come into smash now but i think you raise a good point i think looking at the list and thinking about opportunities for nintendo to either showcase or bring back franchises that have been popular in the past or have some kind of significance to them that have now since been put to rest i think what comes to mind for me is Advance Wars, I'm surprised we've not seen either an assist trophy for... I can't recall if there was an assist trophy for the tank, but isn't certainly... There, isn't there one with a bunch of small little tanks in yeah, the games? Right? Yeah, that's what I'm remembering now. But it, it's interesting to me that we've never seen like a character, um, like a general or a commander who can commandeer like a small tank, like a little vehicle. I think that would be an interesting twist. Um, I think in res- out of respect for Iwata, I wouldn't be surprised if Balloon Fighter is... a. Uh, I think he's a little far-fetched. I, I actually would love that. I think that would be such a great retro character to put in. Exactly. So I think I think um, Balloon Fighter would be an interesting kind of, both respect to Awada, because we know that this company loved this man, and it was a complete tragedy when he passed away. So I think Balloon Fighter, if they could figure out some kind of move set that at least made him viable, or at least fun to play, I think, I think that would be an interesting retro pick. In terms yeah. of their latest games... Um, I think so, Elma... So you know what I'm really surprised about? There's no, like, R... I, you know, like, and, and I think, like, from a character point of view, like, wouldn't that be interesting? You'd basically have, like, the Smash version of Dalsim with the stretchy arms and, you know, maybe some other some other characteristics. Like, I'm not sure if, you know, is Nintendo just kind of waiting to capitalize on that? Because they put, they put a Splatoon character. Yeah, I think, I think there's definitely grounds for more interesting fighting types and characters. I, I think that the important thing that kind of spoke to me when it was revealed that Nintendo has already decided who is going to be among these five DLC was that it was not Sakurai's decision. And I think part of that is interesting to me because Sakurai obviously had a lot of control over the direction of this series. And I think part of why he kept returning is because he and Iwata were quite close friends and Iwata kind of always posed the question of if he would take if Sakurai would do Smash was is was kind of like a favor kind of thing. So it almost to me makes me wonder this new Nintendo, um, now that Kimishima has kind of stepped down and is no longer the interim president and we have a new CEO on board, it's almost like I'm trying to think of it from the angle of like this is a Nintendo that's a little bit more marketing. This is a Nintendo that's more willing to play to memes. This is a Nintendo that is more cognizant of the fact that it needs to leverage its legacy and history and play on social media. And and you know what's even more is that this is a Nintendo that is taking risks. Like we're seeing Nintendo come out with a mobile gacha RPG that has no link to any of its prior franchises in the form of Dragalia Lost, which, by the way, for any of our uh, Nintendo employees who are listening to this podcast, either now or in the future, it's still not available in Canada. Please fix this. Uh, (laughs) I think we're seeing a Nintendo that is really trying to capitalize in a smart way. It's just how big of a company and how much history that this company has within the video game space. So Balloon Fighter to me strikes me as... You know, as much as I want to say that it would be purely out of respect for Awada, I think it's also PR piece. Like, it's it's going to be... You can see the headlines from Kotaku and Polygon. Like, you know, Nintendo developers, engineers, respect Awada, put Balloon Fighter in Smash. It's like a feel-good story. Um, mm-hmm. I think I think with crossover characters, I think... It, you're, you're totally right. I think we're going to see 
some kind of crossover character. I don't think it will be anime, to be completely honest with you, because I think Sakurai is very strict about the characters having to come from a game, Mm -hmm. whereas Goku and anyone from anime, even if they have a game, you know, a game for that franchise, I think it's very obvious if a character came from an anime or a manga first. And I think Sakurai has done his best to try to keep it purely to video games. Um, I mean, I think, in, you know, I can agree with the spirit of that, right? Because then at least, you know, you're representing mechanics and stuff that makes people have, like, faithful experience. Than, exactly. Than just and, watch. Yeah. and I love, and I think people love that. I think people love that Smash has always been this game where you are respecting the history of video games. Previously, mostly Nintendo games, and now tons of classic and modern classic characters. So for me, I think, so my first two would be Balloon Fighter, and I think the second character would not be Geno. I, I think it would be um, a callback to Advance Wars. I think the third character I can think off the top of my head that would be really smart would be Amaterasu from Okami from Capcom. Um, I would love that. And the reason why I'm saying that is because we already saw Okami HD get re-released. We know that this is a series that has welcomed Capcom characters in the past and the Switch has a touchscreen. And now granted you can't play the, with the touchscreen when the Switch is docked, but with the way the IR controls worked and the fact that we previously had an Okami Wii edition, I think this would be the time, and Okami, like, thematically, fits so well with the Nintendo cast. You're a wolf character, you have these brush mm. attacks, you have all these, like, your final smash would be, like, drawing stuff on the screen. Like, there's just so much that could I mean, the only work. way they need to look to Marvel versus Capcom 3 to look at the initial way that how it works. Exactly. Exactly, and then 100%. the other thing, I mean, and then also, like, you know, Bayonetta, like, being a, you know, they, they share, they share, those two, those two franchises share history, right? A Platinum Games history. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so so i mean like you know platinum formerly clover studios right so um so i think that that would that would lend itself to to that, that's actually a great idea and i actually i, I would be over the moon because i yeah. also love so that games. would be my third pick in terms of like a cross company kind of um, dlc i think for the fourth and fifth characters you can kind of shimmy it it's either going to be i don't think they're going to do more than one or two crossover characters they haven't mm-hmm. talked about whether or not they're planning on doing Echo Fighters with the DLC. I think they won't. Mm-hmm. And the reason is because even though I'm sure it takes an incredible amount of time to They'll model these characters. Exactly. Like people will be upset because of the fact that I think Echo characters in people's minds, no matter how much you try to educate the general gaming public that, you know, Echo characters still take time to develop, animate, balance, you know, do all the stuff that costs manpower and effort. People are just going to view that and say this is like a low, low effort cash grab. Like they didn't try yeah, to create. Yeah, and, and I mean, like the thing is, they set a precedent for themselves, right? Like for the reveals of like Ryu and Cloud and Bayonetta. You know that w- those took effort and time, and they were done really well. So I think those expectations are, are you know, are to some degree kind of created and justified. But the other thing too that that you know could be interesting that could actually increase their cred and probably make them feel you know, even better or with public is, you know, they have this DLC character um, that's really cool, like Simon. And then in the same trailer, you have Richter or their equivalent, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, so, you know, one of the ways that they, I think they could really do some smart kind of PR and marketing is again, like, you know, bring a, bring a classic character that people want to see. And then if they have an echo that just fits them very naturally, release them at the same time. So I'm going to hit you with my fourth choice. The fourth character, the classic gaming non-Nintendo character that's going to come back, Bomberman. Yes. Although, <laughs> although I mean, it was kind of like it was kind of like a touch and go topic too when uh, I mean, like, you know, given world events and stuff like that, whether whether Bomberman would be a good idea to put in or not. But at least Super Bomberman are. I exactly. think there's definitely some ideas there. And I think Bomberman would be a fun character. So, yeah, I, I, can, I can see it. I can see it. And then my fifth character is going to coincide with a um, not announced. I'm 100% positive it's in the works. I, I actually have no idea whether that's in the works or not. It's going to be a character from Xenoblade Chronicles X. Takahashi's love child with open between open world games and the first Xenoblade Chronicles. It is going to preface the announcement of an HD re-release of Xenoblade Chronicles X on the Switch. It's going to be Elma. Hmm. Uh, yeah, you know what? I could see it. I could see it. I, I didn't play a lot of Xenoblade Chronicles X, but I, I could see it. I know there's definitely a lot of fans um, who would probably appreciate that. 
Hey guys, thanks for joining us for the first part of our two-parter episode for the Smashcast episode of Post Call Gaming Grand Rounds. We'll be back in one week to talk about all of the latest announced changes in some of the major gameplay elements in Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, and we also go over some of our hopes and dreams for the upcoming World of Light. Stay tuned, and we look forward to seeing you guys at the next clinic.